So if you've been following along with our sermon series on God's liberation as told in the book of Exodus, you will see that we skipped a lot of material between last week and this week. We went from chapter 3 um, all the way to chapter 12. Now, last week the reading was about the incident of, of God calling Moses using a burning bush in the wilderness and God giving Moses the, the, the name of God to give to the people and talking about hearing the cry of the oppressed. Now, Moses is uncertain <laughs> about all of this work. Um, and so God says that Moses can have Aaron's help. God gives Moses these signs of God's power to show to Pharaoh, to to prove who this this word is from. And so Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, demand that Pharaoh lets God's people go. And of course, Pharaoh says no, just as God has told Moses is going to, that's what's going to happen. And so then we get several chapters of these plagues. And uh, if you are a student of Sunday school or if you saw the uh, movie uh, The Prince of Egypt or the old Charlton Heston film, um, you may remember all of these plagues of locusts and frogs and, and rivers turning to blood, these, these horrible things that happen because, most, because Pharaoh will not let God's people go. Now, I think what we need to get from these nine chapters that we skipped is that this work of liberation is not neat, it's not tidy, and sometimes it's not even peaceful the way we want it to be. We also find out in these nine chapters that that the Hebrew people are so beaten down by their enslavement, and that's on purpose on the part of Pharaoh, that they don't even care initially what Moses has to say, that he's trying to lead them out into this promise that God has for them. And when we see the institution of these plagues against the Egyptians, what we're seeing is that God is just wrecking everything about Egyptian society. God is challenging and overturning their their religion as it's based on Pharaoh as a god. God's messing up their economy by, by ruining crops and livestock. God's even challenging their governance. And still, despite all of this turmoil, And all of these hardships, Pharaoh still will not let God's people go. Even the people turn to God and want the Hebrews to be let go, and Pharaoh still does not listen. And then comes the word that there will be one final plague, a sentence of death against all of the firstborns, a plague that's going to decimate the very social structure by which rights and and property and and families are decided in the society, the very thing around which this culture is organized. And so we need to understand that in this time that both the Egyptians and the Hebrew people are living through, this is a terrible time to be in Egypt. This liberation that God is working with the help of Moses and Aaron to to bring the Hebrew people out of slavery. This is a costly and a painful liberation. And yet in the midst of all of this just utter chaos, utter destruction, utter turmoil, everything they know being destroyed, God does this really strange thing especially for a people who are not totally convinced of their need for liberation, and institutes a new ritual for them. And that's the passage we read out of chapter 12 today. So I think we need to ask ourselves why, in the middle of this struggle, why in the midst of this move to liberate the Hebrew people, to bring them out of slavery, slavery, why does God take the time to institute a ritual, an observance, a religious practice. What what is that for? So we need to understand what rituals do for us. Now, first of all, rituals, and this ritual in particular, this, this Passover meal as we call it now, it creates a little bit of order in the midst of chaos. 
When everything is uncertain, when everything is being broken and torn down and and changed and overturned, there's this clear word from God about what the people need to do, how they ought to do it, and what the promise is for them in that action. So in the middle of all of the not knowing, in the middle of all the, of the chaos of change, this ritual creates some order. It creates a rest and a reprieve from all of the chaos. And we know that ours is a God who orders the chaos. In this passage where God is instituting the Passover, we also hear that this observance, the time when it happens, is the first month. It's the start of something new. It's the the start of a new year, of a new time. This is also the function of this ritual. It helps to mark a new time in the lives of God's people. It says, whatever is past is past. The the way you have been living under slavery, the way you have been living in this chaos and this destruction and this new time, we're past the old way, and now we're living in liberation time. And we need that marker. We need that marker that now something new is starting. Now we are in a new place. We're no longer in the transition. We're no longer in the waiting. We're in the new time. We're in the time of being set free. We as humans have a hard time dealing with uncertainty, dealing with transitional times. And so for God to say, now is the first, now is the beginning, it helps us mark a new way of living and a new way of thinking and a new way of worshiping. This ritual also creates a way for the people to to make space in the middle of their servitude, in the middle of their struggle, for a bit of divine communion, for a time of being present with God, of knowing God's presence with them. It's often difficult for us to to know that in the middle of all the chaos that God is actually with us. We, We get distracted, we get burnt out, we get blinded to God's presence with us because of all the struggle, because of all the pressure that's on us. But when we stop and take time for a holy meal, for a ritual practice, for a holiday observance, and I mean holiday in the sense of holy day, that kind of observance, we're making space and we're making time to know God's presence again. And we engage in that in a way that's, that's familiar, that has reminded us of God's presence in the past. Rituals like this one, and, and this still functions for our Jewish siblings in the same way, rituals and, and religious practices like this, they solidify a communal identity. God's people now have a practice that define who they are. In the midst of this place where, where they are no people, where they are other, where the name Hebrew, even who they, the word that refers to them, is not a word of their ethnicity, but a word of their status, that they are lowly and the oppressed. This ritual gives them a sense of, of community. It gives them a sense of who they are. And indeed, the, even the practice as God institutes it is one of sharing The scripture says that if a family can't afford a whole lamb on their own, they need to share with their neighbors. Part of the practice of this Passover, this ritual that God is instituting, is that everybody has enough. Everybody is brought to the table. Everybody is included in it. This is not a a ritual that's about personal experience or personal faith. It's about the communal identity, the, the identity of the whole. And as the Israelite people, the Hebrew people, are led in the future out into the desert, that identity is going to become even more important. Finally, rituals like these, as they continue to be practiced on into the future, they evoke memory. Memory of, of who you are as God's chosen. What it means to be a people who have been set free that no matter what the future holds, there's always a call back to the past. A call back to the time when you weren't free. 
to remember what it means to be set free by God. And that ritual observance helps us remember. Now, oppressive powers, empires, like the one Pharaoh ruled over, they, they are all about making your existence only about supporting the empire. But religious ritual, when it focus, focuses in the way that the Passover does on communal care and I, an identity that's not defined by the empire, but defined by God and God's presence, those in themselves, the ritual in and of itself is an act of resistance and an act of liberation. Now, for us as Christians, Passover is not our ritual, and we shouldn't try to practice it on our own. We can certainly be invited to the table by our our Jewish siblings, but Passover isn't ours. It's not our meal, but Holy Communion is. We have a ritual meal that is ours, and I know that many of us are, are hurting and missing that ritual, probably for a lot of the reasons that I named before. But even though we aren't able to practice the resistance of a holy meal, the resistance and liberation of of a communal ritual, you can practice this at home with your families and with the friends who are part of your bubble. You can still have a ritual meal together as an act of resistance and as an act of God's liberating power. So this this week, set aside some time to have a meal, to sit down together, and make it a special meal. Invite whoever is coming to share whatever gifts that they have, whether that's the food and the cooking, whether it's about decorating and, and setting a table, whether it's about entertaining or praying for people or serving the food, and this this includes children too. I have a friend whose son loves to decorate when people are coming over to eat. And then when you sit down for that meal, talk about your faith. Share special stories. Share about how God has been setting you free. And then even if this meal happens on a Wednesday night or a Tuesday or a Thursday, in the middle of everything that's so busy about the week, When you sit down together, mark that that meal is going to be the beginning of something. That that meal is a reset for you and your family and your friends. I know that for a lot of us, even the idea of stopping to sit down together is crazy sounding. Especially with school starting and people trying to figure out how to do virtual learning while still working. I know for some of us, we're just tired of cooking. But taking that break, setting that side time aside in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the crush, to make things keep going for the sake of the empire, <laughs> despite everything that's going on in the world, take the time, because that's the act of resistance. Taking time for a meal, ritualizing that meal, being with each other in community, Remembering God's presence with you. Those are ways that we connect into God's liberating power, even here and now. Even as people of assorted privilege, however that intersects for you, we are still living in the middle of chaos. And we're still struggling against entrenched powers and seeing movements for liberation happening around us. And so we need to take the time. We need to take the time for for ritual. We need to take the time to stop and to experience what God is doing, not just through our work, not just through the things we do, but also through celebration and rest and ritual. So your challenge this week is to stop, to sit, to eat, to share, and to notice the presence of the one who is setting us free right now in all of our midst.